and run a few minutes late, story of my life. If you happen to fall or stumble across a little brown notebook, about as big as that, maybe a little smaller, that I keep all, everything I know in that book. So, I may never know y'all again unless y'all help me find that book. I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't know what I'm done with it. Hmm? Trick or treat. Bring your light. <laughs> I see what he's talking about. Yeah. Okay. But it's somewhere. I left that thing over at um, Richland Memorial Hospital. I was over there for somebody's surgery went to the bathroom. It fell, it fell out of my pocket. As soon as I got home, I said, oh, my goodness, that thing's gone. That night a guy called me. It was a janitor over at the hospital. He said, you Reverend Holly? I said, yes, sir. He said, did you lose a book? I said, I did. That joker drove all the way to Sumter and brought that book back to me. <laughs> drove all the way to Sumter. I said, man, you ain't got to do that. So that's what, if y'all find it, that's what I want y'all to do. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just give me a, just a word to you, and we got to get started because I'm, I'm late. Just remember Bryce and him. I talked with uh, his mom on the way to the church tonight, and uh, hadn't been a good day for him. I ain't got time to go into details about it, but they... They met the doctor that they were supposed to meet, and things did not work out there, so they're supposed to be meeting another couple of doctors tomorrow, and just a lot of stuff going on. I, it'd take me 20 minutes to tell you all that stuff, so uh, just, just keep him in your prayers. I want to tell you tonight, I'm going I know there's one person here that's heard me preach this before. I did a revival several years ago down in Paxville, and he was there that night. I don't think I've done this here, but it's a great message if I can do it justice. It's called Ken God, and uh, something I've done years and years ago. We serve an awesome God. I want you to let, because this song that I'm fixing to play for you, after I have prayer, describes this message to a T. Father, God, I thank you that we've been able to come back in your house again tonight. Lord, I just pray for our sick. I pray, God, that uh, you would bless them. Father, I just want to say, where would we be if it were not for your mercy and your grace tonight? God, I pray for grace on them. I pray for grace on all people on our list and those that need it tonight. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. i got one more thing I want to ask you to do. I want you to take up an offering tonight. Just a dollar. On Wednesday nights, we take a dollar up every Wednesday night and give it buy a Bible or do some mission work with it. Our kids, our youth, if you in here, they're, they're doing... The girls and the boys always have a competition about who can raise more money. They're going to take this, this money, and they're going to buy food, and they're going to feed the hungry. And each year, we'll usually take up. Now, we're not going to apply it to the, a boy or a girl, but we just go give it to them, and hopefully Clayton will use that. When it's over with, they'll all be even. Won't be no winner or loser here. So, where's my offering place? Uh-uh. Jimmy, just get the money. <laughs> just get the money. And give it to Clayton. Yeah, get it now. Well, I could do that. Yeah, but you take my candy out. Yeah. Don't tell me a lady that works at the bank ain't got no money now.
I'm going to let Dwight go ahead because we need to move along and let him play this song about a Phillips family. I want you, if you ever had any problem trusting God, you need to listen to this song and you need to listen to this message tonight. Play it for us, Dwight. I want you to listen close to the words here because it's going to tie in exactly what I'm talking about in a minute. said he'd do he did and because of that I have no doubt that when he said he's coming back why would I doubt that he never lied about nothing so I believe exactly what that song says I want to talk to you tonight about a God can God will God in the 78th Psalm we have a story of the children of Israel as they're going through a desert. And the psalmist writes this about them. And one of the things that we know about those people when they left Egypt and went into that desert, they like to gripe and they like to complain. We don't get enough food. We, it's hot out here. It's, uh, you know, just kind of like normal people do today. They like to gripe and complain. 
Well, they were no different back then, except they were, were in a wilderness. So let's begin reading with verse 12. Let's do 11. As they went through there, the Bible says that they forgot his works. They forgot all the things that God had done for them. What had he done? He took them out of slavery. He took them out from under the Pharaoh. They wandered in a desert. God fed them every morning. God fed them every night. They didn't have to have a job. They didn't have to buy clothes. The soles of their shoes never got worn out. God provided everything that they needed, and yet what did they do? Complain. Everything. They had it made and didn't know it. They forgot his works, his wonders, that he had showed them. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers. The, their fathers before them had witnessed the same stuff. He divided the sea, caused them to pass through. He made the waters to stand as a heap or a pile. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud. All the night with a light of fire. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down the rivers. And they sinned yet more against him by asking meat for their lust. God, I'm tired of hamburgers. I know tomorrow's hot dog night. Ain't there some way, God, you can give me a filet mignon in there one night? I'm tired of hamburgers and hot dogs and pork chops. Me neither. I'm in heaven there. And so they, they said, God, asking for meat for their what? Not their need, but their lust. And this is the verse. They spake against God, and they said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Can God? There are two kinds of people in, that live in the world today. They're the people that ask the question, Can God? And they're the children of God that have been apart and watched God work in their lives, and they're the people that say, God can. There's a can God people that question God, and there's a, God, a, a godly people that say, God can. So I wrote down a few things that the, the whole Bible, really from you start in the first book of the Bible till you go to the end of the Bible, all 66 books, they're all about what God did or what God can do or what God's going to do. A child of God ought to never question, can God fix this? Can God do something about this? That's a dumb question because you know that the Bible says what? There's nothing impossible with our God. And here are people that have received blessings of God like few other people ever received. It was like being on the government and getting welfare. Had all the food given to them. Had bottled water to drink. All they had to do was sit back in the tent and wait for supper time. That's it. But they could not be happy with the blessings. There's some reason for somehow that people have this thought about them. I deserve the blessings that God gives me. Truth of the matter, when you read the Bible, none of us deserve all the things that God has done for us. And I'm not sure we'll ever count. I, I, when, I, when I put this thing together years ago, I you think in your mind, just you look back at your own life because you know you better than you know anybody else. And of all the blessings that has come my way. So the first thing I want to tell you is this. We serve a God that can turn darkness to light. We serve a God that can turn darkness to light. The Bible says that they sat in darkness 
until they saw a great light. We live in a world today that is what? It's dark. It's dark. And it seems like every week, every month, every year that goes by, it gets darker and darker. When Jesus, in the book of Matthew, in chapter 24, gave signs of the end of time, when he gave those signs, there's only one sign in that whole chapter that he mentioned one, four times. The rest of it he just mentioned one. But he mentioned the sign of deceitfulness, of being deceived four times. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. The world today is deceived and they don't even know they're deceived. They think that the world that we live in and what we see today, because we've got a generation that's been brought up to think this is the way it's always been. No, no, no. Life changed very quickly, and it's moving downhill very fast. We live in a dark world. It says, in whom the God, in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says, that the God of this world has blinded their minds. Where's the first place Satan attacks at? Your mind. You get to thinking. You get to looking. And the next thing you know, you've been deceived, and you go do something that you wish you'd never done. But it all begins up here. It's a mind game. It's a mind game. That's what Satan plays. When I first came here, one of the first books that I preached was the book of John. And in the book of John, the 12th chapter, I just, I just want to read you what it says. In John 12, 40, it says this. That he, talking about who? Satan that he blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, that I should heal them. That is such a true verse of Scripture. Blinded for this reason. The one thing that Satan wants more than anything else is to keep everybody out of heaven. He said their minds have been blinded so that they would not see or believe what God said. He has blinded their eyes to the deceitfulness of sin. People today, you know what they're blinded to? Sin. Preachers don't preach much about it in the pulpit anymore because it's not a popular thing to preach about. But folks... This world is drowning in sin, and they don't even know it. Because what used to be unacceptable is the norm in the world that I live in today. We live in a world full of sin. And it all began with our mind. Satan will get you first there and cause you to doubt. That's what he will do. People are blind. What's the old saying that preachers say? The things that used to walk down the back street now walk down Main Street. That's where we live at today. People used to be ashamed. I bet I heard my mama say a million times, they have no shame. And that was about 50, 60 years ago. They had, what do you think she'd say now? Whoa, my goodness. If she thought they had no shame back then, what would she say? <laughs> maybe and truly they have remember we're talking about the mind here so he blinds us sin has become the norm it has been accepted in the world and in many cases because of that word compromise it has been accepted in the churches today and that's just a fact of life you can't preach against something you accept now a preacher cannot get up there and preach against something that's wrong that he accepts in his mind to be right. Can't happen. So they're blinded to the deceitfulness of sin. 
You know the problem with that? The Bible says that what? That the wages of sin is what? Oh, there's a price to pay someday. Someday. But see, the devil blinds you. He makes you think that fun and joy and happiness down here is what it's all about. Folks, that ain't what it's all about. No, no, no. So people are blind to the deceitfulness of sin. I'll tell you the second thing people are blind about. The need for salvation. I'm amazed. I'll guarantee you, if you go walk in the Senate, walk in the House, walk in a lot of churches, and you would go and ask, Gary, you'd say, say, you'd say, yeah, you saved, yeah, you saved. We have raised up a generation of folks that believe that God is so good, he would never have such a place as hell. We believe that there's a God up there that's so much that he would never send anybody to hell. Well, I want to just straighten that out. God ain't never... Is hell going to be full of people? You better believe it is. But God never sent them there. They went there because they chose to go there. They chose this life over living for God and the life to come. That's what the world has done now. I am amazed. When I grew up, the things that were taboo are right there on Main Street and something right now. They cannot do anything in Sumter County unless there's a party and booze and drinking or whatever there. They can't open a door. They close the store and they open another bar. That's what they do. You know why? It makes everybody happy. I'm going to tell you something. Everybody that that makes happy Better be worried about where they're going. People are blind. You got churches that teach nothing but love, and that's wonderful. Most time on Sunday morning, I'll preach Jesus and love or whatever, and I'll preach that here. But this world and eternity is much more than that now. I'm going to tell you that. There's a great need for people to understand that without Jesus, you don't go to heaven. I don't care if you ain't never missed a night or a meeting in this church ever since this church has existed. That don't mean you're going to heaven. No, no, no. On that same CD Dwight's got there, there's a song on there called Grace Street. And that song will tell you right quick. The only way to get to heaven is walk down Grace Street. That's the only street that goes there. There ain't no other roads that go to heaven but Grace Street. It's a beautiful song. But we've been watch TV personalities, and I hear there, and they're of this faith or that faith, and get on TV and use language that I wouldn't use out in my backyard. And tell me that they love Jesus. Eh, no, not. Your tongue is important. We think what we say don't matter. But we forget this one fact. That up in heaven right now, God keeps a record. He keeps, what the Bible says, He keeps a record of everything we say. You know, if we just think a little bit, when Satan's tempting us, messing up, that God's watching, we might back off a little bit. But we've been deceived. This is the deception. Once I get saved, and Jimmy, you preach to me that once I'm saved, I'm always saved. So if I came down here and I asked Jesus to come in my life, and I believe he did, and you say I'm saved forever, then it don't matter what I do. God can't take my salvation away from me. Sounds good, don't it? There's a lot of people who believe stuff like that. 
So I can go ahead and live, and whenever I die, God's going to... No, 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 no. Salvation is more than just saying a prayer. Salvation is a life-changing event. No salvation comes without repentance, and repentance means this. Quit walking in the direction you're going, turn around, and walk in an opposite direction. You are a new creature in Christ, and all things are new to you. You don't go to places you used to. You don't talk the way you used to. You don't think the things you used to. That's got to take place. Now, it don't happen that day, but the longer you serve the Lord and the longer you live with Him, you grow into that grace. I ain't all I want to be. But thank God I ain't what I used to be. And I ain't what I'm going to be one day. But the world is deceived. They act like God's a, a genie up there in glory, and you only got to do is just call, and he'll do whatever you ask him. No, no, no. But we have been deceived from a God that can turn night into day. Third thing and last thing I want to say about this is people that do not know Jesus Christ, are blind to the joys that a Christian has. Those people up there tonight think y'all are crazy for coming to church every night. Listen to a stupid preacher scream, and they think y'all are nuts. They think I'm nuts. They think we don't have any fun. John, do you have fun? Absolutely. And you ain't got to, <laughs> you ain't got to go to that bar up there and have fun, do you? No. No. They look at us, old Bible thumpers, and they think our life is just miserable. They, oh, we're so sad. We can't have no fun. I'll tell you what, my life has been better since I met Jesus than a thousand times before I met him. I have more joy in my life now, Brother Bill, than I ever had. Y'all are my joy. Christ is my joy. You don't think I love what I'm doing right now? I am the happiest in the world right now doing what I'm doing. Do what? I don't know if that's true or not, Jimmy. You got to be careful when you start talking about my memory. I might not remember how to get home tonight. <laughs> That's why I have a lot of people live out that way so I can get behind them and follow them away to my house. If I see the sign, I'll know I'm there. But they think we're miserable, that we're sad. We love Jesus. We can't have a good. We got to go to church on Sunday, Wednesday, and the church has said what? Well, we'll let you have a little more joy so we'll quit having services. And you go enjoy it. Just come Sunday morning. Just come Sunday morning. How fair is it for the one that died on that rugged cross and gave his life for you and gave everything he had to just come and give him one hour a week? One hour a week? I believe if you love Jesus, you got to show you love him. And where you go and what you say and what you do. Can God? God can. Number two. Can God turn bondage into liberty? And I want to tell you, God can. I'm a God can man. Tomorrow night, I had a sermon that I wrote, Lord, probably back in 89 or 90 or 91. I had it written out on notebook paper. I found it. I gave it to Ron today. She tied it up because I couldn't read my handwriting from back then. <laughs> I asked her. She couldn't either. That thing got a lot of blanks. So I told her, so when you're doing this stuff and you can't write, uh, read what I write, just put a blank there. I, feel, I couldn't even feel that in. <laughs> so I don't know exactly what all you go get tomorrow night. But there's a man in the Bible, and I won't talk too much. I'm going to be talking about him a lot tomorrow. He's called a Gadarenean maniac. A maniac. There's a maniac in the Bible. Matter of fact, there's a bunch of them in there. There's a bunch of them in this world, too. 
There are a lot of people in this world that are bound up by sin. You know, and I ain't got to tell you this. Here was a man, that Gadarene maniac that I'll preach to you about tomorrow night, I think. It could change between now and then. That was full of demons. Full of demons. Everybody in the world was scared of this man, except one man. Jesus passed by. When Jesus passes by, it changes everything. That's all I'm going to say about that, but I'm going to go into much detail more night about it. But he casts those demons out. Can I tell you that we live in a demon-filled, possessed world that we live in today? How many times have I stood here and told y'all there's two spirits in this world? There's a Holy Spirit of God and there's an evil spirit of Satan. And that is it. And I am telling you this is my belief. All this wickedness and evilness and stuff that we see going in churches and shooting people, going in schools and shooting people, doing all this stupid stuff when they walk down the street, just, folks, that's an evil spirit there that's working. Don't just say he's mean or he's crazy. No, he's possessed. Satan is alive and well in the world that we live in today. They're more demon-possessed than they are spirit-possessed. Well, you know this because I've taught you this. What's the one miracle Jesus did more than any other miracle? Cast out demons. He healed some blind folks. He healed some deaf folks. He even raised some from the dead. But you know what he did more than anything else? Cast demonic spirits out of people. We, this, that world of Jesus was filled with it. The world don't understand this because the world is not spiritual. But this world you live in, we got the same problem they had 2,000 years ago when Jesus was here, except it's worse now. It's the same thing. Ain't nothing new. Under the sun. It's different people and different things. He can turn bondage into freedom. I think about people in the world today. They're in bondage. Drug addiction. Drug addiction. That's the evil spirit there. It's a hard spirit. I've dealt with that for a lot of years. It's tough. It's hard. And this is what I was told. Helping someone one night, dealing with that right there. I looked him in the eyes and I said, I don't know how you can lose everything you've got. You've lost your job. You have not a dime in the bank. You have nowhere to live. How did you come to this? I said, I don't understand it. And you know what he told me? He said, you don't understand it because you ain't never been addicted to nothing. Addiction is evil. There are more people killed by drugs that are addicted. And we got a stupid government that gives it to them. Ain't that the dumbest thing you ever heard? People are dying and they're giving them stuff to kill themselves with. It's a mixed up crazy world, folks. It's much worse than them people out there riding up and down the road think. They think everything's hunky dory. We're going to have an election. Everything's going to be fine. I'm here to tell you this right now. Mark it down. It ain't going to never be fine again until Jesus comes. It ain't going to never be fine again until Jesus comes. Matter of fact, I'm here to tell you the worst is yet to come. The worst is yet. God can turn burnt. Bondage. In the freedom. There's a woman in the Bible. You know these stories. Had a sickly disease that was going to kill her. She was bound. She could hardly find nobody to care for her. Like you do. One day she heard Jesus. Was up there in town. So she walked up there. Dying with what we would call a cancer. And there was a big rally going on up there. 
And she was so weak, she could not make her way through. So she laid down on the floor. And she crawled up under all the people that were there until she got under Jesus. She could not raise her hand up to where he was. But it says in the Bible that I just touched the hem of his garment. He said nothing. I just touched. Now, their hems drug the floor. That's how she could reach. But when she touched the hem of his garment, she realized he can heal me. He's a God. And Jesus knew she was there because he said, somebody touch me. Hey, hey who is this? I, I ain't seen nobody. There's a million people around here, but I know one thing. Somebody touch me. And their life will never be the same again. She walked out of there healed. Cancer gone. God can turn a bondage. How many people, we talk about this a lot. We talk about in our church a lot. Oh, how much we talk about people with cancer and stuff now that we hear so much of it now. Those are people that are in bondage. The world is full of people that are enslaved to something other than Jesus. I'm going to tell you that right now. Jesus had a habit. He liked to raise people from the dead. You know that? I was studying. I was off the study, and I studied him. Not with anything to do with this, I don't think. I don't remember what I studied, but anyway. I was studying. Oh, I know it's for the Baptist men's. Uh, breakfast will be this Sunday, Baptist men's. And I'm studying with them the life of Elijah. How God called him out in the mountains to go down and battle King Ahab, the wicked king, and battle the prophets of the evil Baal and all that. He went to a widow lady's house after God had kept him by a creek for three years, took care of him, fed him everything he needed. There was no rain falling. He said, I want you to go to Zarephath. He said, Lord, I ain't never been to Zarephath. He said, why don't you go there now? And when you walk into the city of Zarephath, when you walk in through the gate, most cities had gate. He said, you go find a widow lady there. And when you find her, this is what I want you to tell her. I need you to fix me something to eat. Elijah said, do what? You just tell her that. God's got a working folk. God, God is, he can do anything. What was the response of that lady? I ain't got enough food to feed you, brother. You see that pot right there? I got a little boy. And there's only enough stuff in that pot for me and him. And once we eat what's in that pot, there's nothing else left to eat. God said, tell her, Elijah. Tell her. Elijah said, Lately, let me add, this is what I'll make you a promise. And this is kind of brazen that most people would think. But he says, if you feed me first, before you and your son eat, give me what's in that pot, you'll never go hungry again. You'll never be without food again. Now, you know what? It took a lot of faith for this old widow lady to a man that she'd never met to give him the last meal she and her supper had. But she did. She gave it to him. So I was, I don't taught him all that, but I studied in the next step. Well, the next big event that happened in Elijah's life, and it, you men need to close your ears because y'all here this Sunday morning. That little boy died. She woke up one morning, went to his bedroom, and he's dead. She goes into a panic like any mother would. She knows Elijah's a man of God because she's already called him a man of God. So she starts hollering for him. 
Elijah comes in the room and sees the little boy dead in the bed. Elijah goes, and he lays down on top of that little boy. The Bible says he puts his hands in his hands, his feet on his feet, his chest on his chest. And he what? Prayed. Got up. Second time, went back and laid down on him and prayed for him again. Got up. Got up. What's that number I'm telling you about? Three. All right. Number three, he goes back, lays down on top of him, stretched out, prays for him a third time. <laughs> And all of a sudden, there was life in that little boy. He just thought he had a bad dream. He wakes up. I don't know what he said, but I like to paraphrase this stuff a little bit. Brother Elijah, what you doing here in my room this time in the morning? Oh, I just come to wake you up. He picked that little boy up, carried that little boy down to his mama. Look what my God has done. Your son is alive. That's my God. Can God heal the sick? You better believe he can. Why we pray for Bryce and him like we do. We expect healing. Up. Don't we expect healing? I believe my God to do that. He can raise the dead. Do you know that that little boy that he raised up is the first person in the Bible that God ever raised from the dead. First person ever raised from the dead was that little boy that Elijah laid on and prayed for. First person. Bye, y'all. Go back. be back in a few minutes. We've got to quit. i got to go. I'm going to give you a little break. But y'all got to.
And one day David was in his throne room, and he says, because he had told and made a pact with Jonathan that he would take care of his family. And King David says, is there anybody in his family that I can show kindness to? And on that song, it said the soldiers came knocking at his door. That was a young man named Ephibothus. He was crippled. He could not walk. And they carried him to King David. And, of course, in that song, he says, the king said, I will show you kindness for Jonathan's sake. Then it says that I was crippled, eat up with sin, and they come to get me and to carry me before the king. And the king says to him, I will show kindness to you for Jesus' sake. Ain't that good? That's a wonderful, beautiful song right there. All right. We never go get through. We even get close to getting through this. So I'll go as far as I can and quit. Can God or God can? Which people are you, a can God person or a God can person? God can person, right? First point was God can turn your night into day. Second point was God can set you free from whatever bondage that this world's got you in. Third point that I won't get to, that goes along with that song. God can turn your doubt into blessed assurance. Well, what do you mean? Ever been a time in your life when you doubted where life was headed? Ever been a time in your life where you doubted whether God could fix whatever's wrong? Ever been a time in your life where you doubted that God could change the circumstances you were just doomed from there? Well, our God doesn't work like that. Our God can take that doubt that we have in our life and He can turn it to reassurance because the Bible is full of that. One of the men in the Bible that is known more for his doubt than probably anybody else in the Bible was a man named Doubting Thomas. He said, I will not believe, I'll doubt that he is Jesus, and I'll doubt that he's the Son of God, and I'll doubt that he hung on an old rugged cross unless I see the scars in his hand. I doubt whether Jesus is Jesus. But when he went to that room after he was resurrected and the disciples were there and Thomas walked in and he looked at Jesus and he showed him his hands and he said this. He said, my Lord and my God. God needs to remove doubt from our mind on what he can do, of who he is. Doubt makes you weak is what it does. Don't doubt the God that made you, the God that created you. Don't doubt that. Paul made this statement. Paul hated doubt. God for a big time of his life. He tore churches down. He killed people because he didn't like God. But one day when God knocked him off his horse and blinded him just like that, and God began to talk to him, and we call it that Damascus Road experience that changed his life and probably made him the most famous apostle in the Bible, the man that wrote more books in the Bible than anybody else did. This is what Paul said. I believe in my God. We've got to believe that God, when we have doubt in our life about what's happening, how many times in your life have you ever said to God, Why? Why? My little girl. Why me, Lord? 
God knows the answer to that, but he may never give you an answer. But you need to not have doubt that know, God knows what's going on. And that's right, I, I try to encourage uh, Bryce and his family. Would I talked to his mom on the way to church today for a long time. It's a, but she sent me a text between the time I went out and come back, and, and on that text it had a picture. She said, I had to run to the drugstore and get Bryce some of that new medicine they ordered him. And she had a picture of the sky. It was just bright blue. And it had clouds that shaped like a mouth. And she said, when I looked up there and I saw that, I felt God was speaking to me. God has his ways now. I believe in God, Paul said. There was a dad in the book of Mark that had a sick child. He'd heard about Jesus. He didn't know about Jesus other than what he'd heard. He'd never met him. But when Jesus, he asked him to come to his house. And Jesus comes to his house. And he heals the sick one that is in his house. But first, when Jesus comes in there, these are the words that the man said, Will you help my unbelief? I don't believe you can do this. That's death warmed over there. I don't believe. I've heard that you could, but it's hard for me to believe because I don't believe in Jesus. I've just heard about you. And I don't know, Jesus might have said, well, why did you call me? <laughs> That's what I'd say, but Jesus wouldn't say it like that. Why would you call me? You don't believe in me. But he said the words that were key. Help my unbelief. Sometimes the devil will slap you so hard, you really wonder if God can do what he says he'll do. Have you ever been a time in your life where you ever doubted whether you were saved or not? I have. I've had many doubts over the years whether I was saved or a child of God. But God met me on a Damascus road all about 50 years ago. He helped my unbelief, changed my life. I don't doubt. There's not one person in this world who can make me doubt whether I'm a child of the king tonight or not. Nobody can make me doubt that. Because John says, I know that I know that I know. I got a t-shirt. Says that. I know that I know that I know. The doubt is removed about that. Number four. God can turn defeat into victory. Have you ever had any defeats in your life? Life ever got messed up? There's a God that loves us and can turn that defeat into victory. I'm going to tell you that now. Can God turn whatever's hurting me, whatever's broke my heart? Can God turn that? You better believe he can. The Bible is full of people that he did that to. And what the, one of the greatest examples I know about turning defeat into victory was the story of Jesus, uh, Peter as the fisherman. Jesus walked up on him after he'd been fishing all night. He was cleaning his nets, packing up to go home. Jesus said, where's your fish at? He said, oh, we don't have no fish. Now, I'm paraphrasing again. Jesus probably said, I thought you was a fisherman. He said, I am a fisherman. Well, why ain't you got no fish? Mark, you ever been there? Ain't never caught no fish? <laughs> Maybe once he lied in the chair. <laughs> Maybe once. Terry? See, Terry tell me the truth. But Terry did win a fishing tournament this weekend. Let's give him a hand. There you go. He won a fishing tournament last weekend. First one in his life. There you go. <laughs> he said, what's the problem? There ain't no fish out there. He said, we've told. Have you ever fished so hard that, working, that fishing became work to you? 
They said, we toiled all night. It's been a job. We ain't got nothing to show for it. Jesus said, I, I can fix this. Jesus can fix anything if you trust him. Peter, will you listen to me? Turn that boat around. Just go out a little bit and throw your net out. So he had to get his net back up, put it on the boat. Pushed out a little bit, threw his net out, and you know the story. He caught more fish than he could even handle. The boat started sinking. He caught so many fish. He had to call another boat over there to help him put the fish in so they both didn't sink. Can God turn defeat into victory? You better believe he can. And then what did Peter do? He got back on the boat where Jesus was, and the Bible says he fell at Jesus' feet. And now he believed him. I believe you. I know that you are the Son of God. And so he did this. I am going to get through with this. Number five, I ain't taking a lot of time. And this is one I really love. I was listening for the trumpet, y'all. I said, here we go. <laughs> Grab a hold of somebody. We didn't leave him. <laughs> hey! Well, day I started to say, Lord, you don't answer all my prayers yet. I can tell them about turning vic- uh, defeat and victory. We fix and show them we fly away from him. Oh, Hallelujah. Remember when Jesus was on the boat one time? And the storm came up. The weather channel didn't forecast it. They ain't. What I tell you, don't believe the scientists. The scientists don't know jack. Jesus is sleeping. These 12 guys that follow him, the wind starts blowing, and what happens? The water keeps flooding in the boat. They think they're going to sink and die. They see death coming. They forgot who was in the boat with them. And all the miracles he'd done before them, until it got so desperate, they felt like this was it. And then they go downstairs and says, Master, can you come up here a minute? Jesus is sleeping. You think he worries about a storm? He makes a storm. He wipes his eyes. What's going on, Peter? Man, you can't feel this boat rocking here and that water sloshing in. We're fixing to sink. So Jesus walks up there and gets on the deck and says, Peace be still. I got that picture in my office hanging on the wall. Peace be still. God can turn a storm. Everybody, I'll guarantee you, that has lived to be 50 years old has had some kind of storm come through their life. A storm that broke you down. A storm that hurt you. A storm that maybe even sometime you thought you might not recover from. But then Jesus came by. Things always change. Every time in the Bible that Jesus passed by, nothing ever stayed the same. Zacchaeus. I started to tell you, I think I preached that to you before, so I kind of put it on the back burner about old Zacchaeus. Up that sycamore tree. Zacchaeus come down. I'm going to your house today. My house is a mess. You don't want to go there? Yeah, I do. I'm going to go there. Zacchaeus was scared of him. He didn't know what he was getting into if Jesus come to his house. He might have had something in there he didn't want Jesus to see. He's a tax collector. He's a thief. But Jesus came by. Everything changes when Jesus passes by. When that storm come up, I love this. Jesus comes up and gets up there on the boat with them. 
And these are his words that he says to them. Why are you so afraid? That's what he would say to all of us. What are you afraid of? Why are you afraid? The Bible says that if we have that spirit of God living in us, we have no need to fear any man or anything. The closer we get to God and the more we understand Him, there should be no fear. I preach a lot of doomsday, end of time stuff to y'all, but y'all don't need to be afraid of that. God will come up out the boat and get you. God will come up and get you. Every time. But God, number this will be the sixth thing, last thing. God can turn death into life. He's the only man who can do that. The Bible says this, and I love this verse of Scripture, because this is where most people, the first part of it are, and the last. This is most people in the world. This Scripture describes spiritually them. It says this, If in this life only you have hope, then you are of all men most miserable. If all you are depending on is what you got in this life, the Bible says you're miserable. You know why? Because I'll tell you, one day the bank's going to foreclose. <laughs> one day something's going to happen. One day you're going to leave here and go somewhere and somebody else go enjoy everything in your bank account, your car, your house, whatever you got. Somebody else will enjoy that while you're gone. If in this life only you have hope, then you're of all men most miserable. I told you about the first person in the Bible that was ever raised from the dead was the widow's little son. The most famous person that was ever raised from the dead was who? Lazarus. Lazarus. By far, the most famous. Did Lazarus have to die? You better believe he did. Did Jesus have to wait four days before he came? You better believe he did. They kept sinning. They said, you need to come. You Remember Lazarus and Mary and Martha, they were his best friends. He stayed with them when he was in that area. Lazarus is sick. You need to come touch him and heal him. He said, I ain't going now. Two days, he's sick. What happens to you? He died. In the Bible, when you're dead three days, they believe you ain't no good no more. You're done. There ain't nothing. Ha- three days is it. They take the hands off of you, and they let you go. And they tell Jesus he's too late. He comes walking down there where Lazarus is, and Martha, she just jumps on him. If you'd have been here, this wouldn't happen. This is all your fault. This here, this, this should have never happened if you'd have come when I sent somebody to get you. And, and then she says, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. Oh, he would have too. That was an appointed death and appointed rest. You know why? Because we're still talking about tonight. Because we still have hope. That because he raised Lazarus up, he's going to raise Jimmy up or raise you up. If you know the Lord, you're going to go to heaven. Hey, this is a wonderful story here. If you'd have been here, you wouldn't have died. Can God, can God raise the dead? He raised his own son, didn't he? Jesus was dead when they put him in that tomb now. They raised him up out of that tomb. Death is not the final say so in your life. If you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. Jesus says, chill. I got this. Lazarus, come out of that tomb. Everybody's looking. Like a mummy comes out there. He's all wrapped up from head to toe like a mummy. All wrapped up. Walks out of that tomb. 
Jesus said, Lazarus, you alive? He said, I feel like I'm alive. I think I'm breathing. I can see you. There's my two sisters there. I see them. <laughs> Lazarus come forth. He comes out with all that cemetery stuff on. They wrapped them in like a mummy when they buried them. Head, rags, and all. Oh, I love where I'm fixing to go, and I'm going to quit with this. Lazarus, you alive? And then he says, Loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go. Take them rags off of him. He ain't dead no more. Loose him. Problem with us, we've been made alive sometime, but we ain't been loosed yet. And we as Christian people, we need to get loose sometime. Loose him. Get them old grave clothes off for him because he ain't dead no more. He's alive. He's alive. The Bible says that he who was dead came forth. You think Lazarus didn't have a story to tell? Somebody dropped by his house and said, Lazarus, tell me what happened. He said, I don't know. I was in there dead. And they said, get up and come out. And I came out. Jesus knows your name. Everybody in cemeteries ain't coming out when God's people come out. When he sounds that next trumpet that we're waiting to hear, if you don't know Jesus, you ain't going to hear it. There's a song, I, I guarantee you, you know it. I miss it. I hadn't played it in a while. It's called He Called My Name. Y'all know that? He called my name. He knows your name. He knows your name. And just like that first song that I played, when he said, I was lost in my sins, and I went before the king. And he said, because of Jesus, I'm going to show you kindness. Do I deserve kindness? No. Am I going to get kindness? Yes. Am I going to get a mansion? He said I would. All I know is he's been up there 2,000 years working on it. I know lumber's high, and I know all that. Hey, streets of gold. Gold's high. Gold in heaven, penny ounce. There'd be gold everywhere up there. Pearly gates. Wow. I can't wait. I'll be honest with you. I wish that shout would come before I got to the house tonight. I wouldn't have to worry about that stupid book I lost <laughs> if it comes. God say you ain't going to need to know them names no more. Some of them might not even be here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm through. I quit. Go. See you tomorrow night.